Hi friends, and thank you for joining us in this nightly read-along. Don't forget to ask your parent to subscribe so you don't miss any future chapters. Now here's Miss Kate with tonight's chapters. The Parker Inheritance, Chapter 19 Hey Candace, Brandon's mother said as she opened the door on Monday morning. She held a cup of steaming coffee. Brandon's in the backyard with that basketball. Why don't you go on out there? And feel free to stick around for dinner tonight. No point in y'all cooking when we have plenty of food here. We're having spaghetti. Candace slipped off her backpack and walked through the kitchen to the back door. Brandon stood a few feet away from a basketball goal, the ball spinning in his hand. He squared himself up, raised his arms, and took a shot. The ball arched toward the hoop, rotating in space before swishing through the rim. All net. Nice shot, Candace said. Brandon's head whipped around. Oh, hey. He looked at his watch. Sorry, lost track of time. It's okay, Candace said. You can keep practicing if you want. I'll just take a few more shots, he said as he chased down the ball. It had come to a stop in the tall grass. It's kind of hard to dribble back here, so I mainly work on my shooting, trying to up my three-point percentage. He picked up the ball, then moved even farther from away from the rim. He banked the basketball off the backboard and into the net. It wasn't until five shots later that Brandon missed his first bucket. Brandon was good, way better than she expected him to be, even after learning he used to play on a team with Milo. She felt a little guilty about this new revelation. Brandon was so small and so bookish, she just assumed he wasn't very athletic. Brandon took a final shot, then lobbed the ball toward Candace. Want to try? Candace straightened her stance like she'd learned in gym class, then launched the basketball at the goal. Air ball. I'm better with puzzles, she told Brandon as she chased the rolling ball. They returned to the computer room a few minutes later. Tori found a few more things she thought she'd like, Brandon said, nodding toward the small plastic bag on the bed. The bag was tied tight, but Candace was able to pull it open enough to peek inside. Some of the clothes still have tags on them. Tori never met a sale she didn't like. He sat down at the desk. So what's the next step? The old church building? We need to call Deacon Draper to set up a time. In a second, Candace rifled through her backpack until she found her hand-drawn calendar. This is for you, she said. It's Milo's weekly schedule. Brandon took the paper. What? How? That's why I was asking his mom so many questions yesterday. I was trying to figure out his schedule. It had reminded Candace of Sudoku, a puzzle game her grandmother had first introduced her to. But instead of completing a number grid, she was trying to fill in dates, times, and locations. It wasn't easy, especially with her mom's phone as the only way to get on the internet, but she was eventually able to piece together not only when Milo had practices, games, and meetings, but also where they were. Based on the city website, Milo probably has swim lessons twice a week. The closest pool is still pretty far away, so I bet someone drives him and brings him back. That's why that's colored in green. Basketball practices are in red. The Y is a lot cl closer, so he probably bikes there. I bet that's where he was coming from the other day. She shrugged. I had to take a guess on Boy Scouts and choir practice based on an old church calendar I found online. It's not perfect, but I figured it was my ma way of making up for last Friday. What are you talking about? You know, how you didn't want to bike to the school and how you wanted to get something to eat afterward. It was obvious you didn't want to be riding around, she said. I guess I just wasn't paying attention. I could have been more honest, Brandon said, and to be fair, avoiding Milo wasn't the only reason I wanted to go to Sam's. Then why? Candace waited, but Brandon didn't speak. She nudged his chair with her foot, causing it to swivel. Why? she asked again. I just wanted to treat you to lunch. She glanced at the bag of clothes Tori had left for her. Then she thought about his mom's dinner invitation. Are you being nice to me because you think we're poor? You guys don't think we can afford a meal? Not exactly. And these clothes, did you make Tori get them for me? I can't make Tori do anything. I don't want your charity, Brandon. It's not, that's not why I'm being nice, he made a face. Okay, that's not the only reason I'm being nice. I also wanted to hang out more. The summer kind of sucked before you got here. She flexed her knee, watching the hole in her jeans expand. We're not poor. I know, but we're not rich either. Writers don't make a lot of money, and Dad is doing really well at his job, but things only go so far. She took a peek at Brandon. His face was blank. Not inviting, but not condemning either. You know we're selling our house in Atlanta. He nodded. My mom told me. Are you selling the house here? I don't think so, Candace said. Mom's already got another renter lined up for the fall. That'll bring in more money, but not enough to stop her from selling my house back home. So that's why you want to find Parker's money? Brandon asked to save the house. Candace nodded. I'd share whatever I found with you, of course, 50-50. It's okay, Brandon said. The first priority is to buy the house. We'll figure out how to split the rest afterward. Candace crossed her arms and pinched her sides. She hated saying all this stuff out loud. It made it more real. 
At least now I know why you want to find the money so badly, he said. I would hate to move after living in a place for so long. She almost corrected him. It wasn't only about the money. It was about her grandmother as well, about fixing her legacy. But there was no way Candace could say that out loud right then. How long have you lived here again, she asked. About three years. We would visit during the summer, but we moved for good when Mom got a job at the tech college. I'm still trying to get used to this place, he smiled. Though those chili cheese dogs from Sam's really are the best. Okay, okay, we'll get your fancy hot dogs after we do some more investigating, but I'll pay for my own. Deal. And I'll talk to Tori about the clothes. I think my mom believes y'all are worse off than you really are. Candace chewed on the inside of her mouth. Maybe their finances were worse than she realized. So, Deacon Draper, Brandon asked. I already called him this morning before I came over. He said he found some old boxes of photos that he could bring over. Candace pulled the yearbook from her bag, then handed Brandon another sheet of paper. And that's a list of all the players and coaches from the tennis team in the yearbook. The same photo that was in the glass case at the memorial. None of the guys are named James Parker, but maybe there's a connection. Brandon stared at the paper, but didn't move. What is it? Candace finally asked. It's just, what does all this have to do with Siobhan? Brandon asked. The letter said she's the key, not James Parker. He's probably keeping himself anonymous because he doesn't want the focus to be on him. Trust me, Brandon, this is important. The more information we have about him, the better. Plus, some of these guys might lead to more information about Siobhan, too. Brandon took a deep breath and nodded. They began their internet search, moving down the list name by name. They were able to find information on most of them. About half had passed away. As far as they could tell, none of them still lived in Lambert. Back to the athletic director, Adam Douglas. Is there any way he could be James Parker? She had checked. He was the only white teacher at the school that year. I don't think they're the same person. The chin, nose, and eyes are all wrong. He glanced at his notes. Plus, according to his obituary, he was still teaching at Perkins when James Parker was running all those companies in Colorado. There's no way he could do both. Candace twirled a strand of hair around her finger. Her fancy hairdo for church had lasted less than a day. Do you have the link to the obituary? Maybe he has a son. Brandon reopened the website. Looks like he had a son named Charles Douglas. Okay, so maybe he's James Parker. I guess that's possible. But we don't know if he even knew Siobhan. How could, he could have been 10 years older or younger. Candace reached for the Perkins yearbook and stopped herself. Charles Douglas wouldn't be listed there either. We should go back to the high school to see if we could find some old Wallace High yearbooks. And maybe we could have Deacon Draper bring the photos there now. If my schedule is right, Milo should be heading to the pool soon. Brandon nodded. I'll call Mrs. Ms. McMillan. After he left the room, Candace opened the yearbook and flipped to the photo of the tennis team. Adam Douglas and Enoch Washington stood, sti stood, si stood in the back behind their players. A black man and a white man, side by side. She wondered if they were friends. Chapter 20 Enoch Washington, July 24th, 1957. Big Dub rattled the ice in his almost empty glass as Robert Hicks, the Perkins football coach, pulled up to his house. It was just past nine o'clock at night. The mulberry trees in his front yard swayed in the warm breeze. Dub stood up from his rocking chair, folded his well-worn copy of the New York Times under his arm, then finished off his scotch. It tingled as it slid down his throat. Already getting started, Dub? Robert asked as he walked across the grass. Dub had mowed the yard that morning, and clippings still littered the concrete carport. I'm celebrating. That's what you have been saying for the past two weeks, Robert laughed. You'd think you were the, you were the one playing in Wimbledon. I saw her play once, he said, in high school. Big Dub picked up the bottle of scotch for a refill, but Robert stopped him from uncapping it. Slow down there. Save some drinking for the game. I saw Althea Gibson play once, Big Dub began again. She was better than every other Negro on the court. He pushed the newspaper into Robert's hands, and now she's better than all the other than all the whites. Robert looked at the newspaper. It was folded to an article about Althea Gibson's ticker tape parade in New York City, a celebration of her victory at Wimbledon. She was the first Negro to win a single tennis championship there. Your cousin from up north sent this to you? Came in yesterday. He tipped his glass again, letting the last drops of scotch and melted ice hit his tongue. That could be little dub in a couple years. She could win Wimbledon. She could win them all. And when's the last time she picked up a racket? Silly girl, so stubborn. Wonder where she got that from. Big Dub let out a sigh. Lil Dub had even stopped accepting the crossword puzzles he used to buy for her. I ain't gonna fight about Siobhan with you. I got, I get enough of that from Leanne. But that girl is gonna play tennis whether she likes it or not. She will if she wants me to pay for college. Good luck with that, Robert said. You don't have kids, you don't understand, Big Dub said. A parent's job is to protect their children, even from themselves, especially from themselves. 
I think Lil Dub might have other ideas about that. He pulled his keys from his pocket. Come on, the sooner we get to Smitty's, the quicker I can win his money. Their friend and fellow teacher, Dwayne Smith, lived on farmland on the county line. They played cards at his house once a month, so they usually did more bragging than actual playing. Robert pulled out of the yard and started down the street. Turn left here, Big Dub said. Take Loyola. Why? Just do it. I want to see something. Robert did as Big Dub instructed. He typically took Darling Avenue to the highway, as it avoided most of the white areas of town. But today, Dub was directing him right into a run-down white neighborhood. Slow down, Big Dub said. They neared a ball called the watering hole. Dub, he's there, he said, slapping his hands on the Oldsmobile dashboard. Turn in. You crazy? I ain't going inside. I just want to leave something on Coach Turner's car. Coach Thomas Turner was a science teacher and tennis coach at Wallace High School. The boys' team had won the state championship that year. Dub often said that his boys would have won a championship as well if there were enough colored high school teams in the state to have an actual tournament. Robert turned on his signal but didn't enter the dirt parking lot. Why you want to start something with Coach Turner? What do you ever do to you? Nothing, and that's the problem. Dub folded the paper, making sure the photo from the ticker tape parade was front and center. Come on, I want Coach to know that tennis ain't a white boys only sport anymore. Robert tightened his grip on the wheel as he steered into the parking lot. He stopped the car and scooted down. Now hurry up, I'm not trying to get lynched because of you. Dub opened the car door and stepped into the dark night. He slipped the paper underneath the windshield wiper, then ran back to the car, an alligator-shaped grin plastered across his face. It was almost midnight when a car sped into Dwayne Smith's driveway. Who in the world is that? Smitty asked, stumbling from the table. He had lost all of his poker chips long ago, but since it was his house, Robert and Dub let him continue playing. He glanced out the window. It's Coach Douglas. What's Adam doing here? Dub asked. One of y'all invite him to the game? Smitty opened the door for Adam Douglas. He surveyed the men in the room, then leveled his gaze at Dub. Tell me the truth. Did you leave that newspaper on Tommy Turner's car? Dub smiled. Maybe. Damn it, Dub. Adam slammed his fist into his palm. They're on their way over here now. Should be here any second. Doug took a sip from his glass. Fine, let them come. Just then, a car horn pierced the night. Everyone in the room jumped. Adam ran to the window. Shoot, it's them. The horn sounded again. Three long bursts. Big Dub and Robert joined Adam at the window while Smitty ran to the kitchen. I guess they didn't like that article, Dub said, chuckling. This ain't funny, Adam said. Robert, hit the light on the front porch. Smitty returned carrying a shotgun and a case of shells. What do you think you're doing, Adam asked him. He loaded the gun barrel. I got a right to defend myself. They're trespassing. And you're drunk. And they're white. You'll be arrested, convicted, and hooked up to the chair before you could blink. Adam glanced outside again. They ain't caring. Let me go out and talk to them. Find out what they want. Big Dub moved toward the door. I'll come with you. Absolutely not, Adam said. Wait here. I'll be back in a second. The others crowded around the window as Adam stepped on the porch. Turn off your brights, he called. I can't see you. The car headlights went dead. Dub let his eyes adjust to the dark. He could make out four men as they walked toward the house. Three he recognized as teachers from Wallace. The other was Marion Allen, the son of the most, one of the most powerful men in the city, something Marion made sure everyone knew. Your coaches are paper boys now? Coach Turner asked, holding up the newspaper. And don't lie and say it wasn't Dub. Rich saw him in the parking lot. It was a joke, Tommy, Adam said. You see anybody laughing? Marion Allen slurred, his two eyes narrowing into blue pinpricks. Big Dub didn't think he was arrested. Big Dub didn't think he was armed, but he couldn't be sure. And if he was, Dub wasn't about to let Adam get hurt over something he started. He didn't always like the man, but Adam Douglas was always, had always done right by him. Big Dub blinked and shook his head, hoping to clear the static from his brain. All that scotch didn't seem so smart now. But he felt calm, in control. He wasn't going to let those good old boys bully him around. Smitty, have that shotgun ready, he said. Then he stepped outside, his feet heavy against the creaking porch. Hey, Dub, Coach Turner said. Hello, Coach, Dub acknowledged, tipping his head. Is there a problem out here? I sure as hell think there is, Marion Allen said. He charged ahead, then stopped at the base of the porch steps. Dub didn't slouch, didn't show any cowardice. He wanted Marion Allen to see just how big and bad he could be. We're sorry about the newspaper, Adam said, stepping between Dub and Marion. Now y'all go on home. Tommy, we can sort this out tomorrow once we've all sobered up. You think coloreds are better than white boys? Marion Allen asked. I never said that. Big Dub had to work hard to keep his body still, to keep from going down those steps and grabbing Marion by th Allen by the throat. Nobody cares about some color girl winning a tennis match in England, Marion said. 
The people of New York City cared. They threw her a parade. I don't care what they do up north, Marion said. I bet my little brother could whip that black. Marion, Coach Turner slapped. Enough. Marion smirked. All I was going to say was I bet my brother could be any of the boys on Dub's team. That was most definitely not what Marion Allen was about to say. Big Dub almost said as much until he got a better idea. He crossed his arms and stared at Marion Allen. Prove it. What? Prove it. Have him come out and play against one of my boys. Marion didn't seem to know how to respond. He gave off a weaselly chuckle as he looked at the men behind him. As a good an idea as that may be, we both know that ain't going to happen, Coach Turner said. Now come on, Marion, let's go. Why can't it happen, Big Dub asked. He moved so he could look directly at Turner. Why not? Coach Turner rolled his eyes. Adam, will you let your tennis coach, will you tell your tennis coach to shut up? Adam Douglas didn't speak for a few moments. He slowly rubbed his face, then let out a long sigh. You know, Tommy, I think Dub might be onto something. You serious? Coach Turner frowned. Well, just because you're a fool to support this doesn't mean my athletic director and principal will. Then don't tell them, Dub said. Y'all just built new courts at your school, right? Behind the gym, hidden from the highway? He leaned against the porch railing. A splinter dug into his hand, but he wasn't about to wince. Just a friendly little tournament, an exhibition, nothing official. That is, unless y'all are too scared. Enoch, Adam said. I think he gets the point. Big Dub's grin widened. What do you say, Coach Turner? He reached out his hand. Instead of all this talk, let's settle it on the court. Your boys against mine. Coach Turner scratched his chin. No tricks, no publicity, just us and the boys. Just us and the boys, Big Dub repeated. Do we have a deal? Coach Turner walked to the porch and shook his hand. I'll call Adam tomorrow to sort out all the details. Mary and Ellen pointed at Big Dub, then spat on the ground. Boy, you're going to regret this day for a long time. Robert and Smitty exited the house as Coach Turner's car pulled onto the street. Adam's face was twisted into a tight frown. Dub, I just put my neck way out there for you. I hope you know what you're doing. What, you think we're going to lose? Big Dub asked. No, Adam replied. I'm worried we're going to win.